Good morning again. The Hebrew Bible reading today, the only one, is from Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the seraphs, sorry, satraps, the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and magistrates and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and the entire ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship the statue be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abdim, Ab, Ab, <laughs> Abedgo. These pay, pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, It is true, uh, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the hornpipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire music ensemble to fall down and worship that statue I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O oh, king, let him deliver us. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, who was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted, he ordered the furnace be heated up seven times more than customary, and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace so overheated, the raging, raging flames killed the men who, were lift, who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men that we threw in, bound into the fire? So they answered the king, O oh, true king, he replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace 
of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps and prefects, the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's demand and yielded up their bodies, rather than serve the, and worship any god except their own. Therefore I make this decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I've got to give her a hand for that. That was... <laughs> And now a, a prayer for the preacher. It is called Fear and, and Faith. Shall we await the days ahead unknown in fear or faith in you? Shall we obsess with searching eyes or settled hearts in truth? When nothing seems predictable, when pain is close at hand, when distraction beckons from the abyss, time flows in the hourglass of sand. The path is winding out of sight, the horizon hard to find. So we turn our gaze to the earth below, our dreams being left behind. Yet, day by day, you offer us the future to behold. And as we learn to trust in you, my Lord, meaning can unfold. So as we unwrap the mystery and journey day by day, let us know in both fear and faith, your gifts and presence remain. Lord, may Pastor Terry remember the days, in the days, months, and years to come, that we are on the same journey as she is, that we are here to call upon, that we are holding her in our hearts and prayers, and that we believe she is walking in your guidance. May our days be filled with far more faith than fear of the unpredictable future. May our gaze fall to the immediate steps ahead when the horizon seems obscured from sight. May temporary concerns not cloud out her dreams. In your name, Lord, and your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Did you write the poem? I did. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, those of you who prayed for me last week, I thank you because I had my spinal ablation on Friday, and I am feeling a little bit better, a little bit. It's coming along. But my doctor, Dr. Block, is kind of a funny guy. He really has an interesting sense of humor. I hadn't seen him since I had my first ablation, which was December of 2022. And he said, what happened to you this time? As I came in sort of having trouble walking because last time he said to me, you need to buy a lottery ticket, girl. I said, why? He said, because your luck's got to change sometime. So he said, what happened to you this time? I said, well, since I've seen you, my mom died and I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And he said, wow, did you get your lottery ticket? I said, yep, but I didn't win. Let's look at this passage. Now, Daniel is the latest book written in the Hebrew Bible. It's the last book written, which is strange because it's talking about Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, which happened years before. But this was at the time of the intertestamental period beginning. Anybody remember what happened then? Anybody have a story about the intertestamental period that you know about? I guess not. That's okay. Jewish history is not one that we know very well, is it? Have you ever heard of Masada, the, the fortress on the hill where they were the Jews held off this group of attackers for quite some time? They, they eventually perished, but they lasted a lot longer than anybody thought they could because God was on their side, they believed. And then there was the, um, the revolt that happened, and the Jews were attacked by Ptolemies, the Ptolemies, which was another group of people. And... You don't know all those stories, huh? Well, the Jews really prevailed, in a sense, although they were eventually overrun. But Hanukkah happens at that time. Remember the story of Hanukkah? 
how that started, what happened in the temple. It had enough oil for one day and it burned for eight days. So it was a sign of God's providence with them. So why would you set a story in a time like that back in the time of Nebuchadnezzar? Why would you bother to tell the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or even Daniel, who faced the lion's den and survived? I ask you if anybody has any problems these days. Anybody having a tough time these days? How about the nation? Are we having a tough time in the nation these days? So what's what's why is it important to remember a story like this in those tough times? Hope. Amen for hope. For the reminder that God is with us no matter what we face, we never face it alone. So I read that passage to you. I didn't read it, you read it through the call to worship from Isaiah. This one's for my funeral service. Not that I am thinking I'm dying. I don't know you thinking that. I heard my funeral service years ago. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, they will not hurt you. When you pass through the fire, it will not hurt you. It's God's promise to us. No matter what we face, we never face it alone. It's a wonderful promise. So here we are in a day when it's trouble in the world. There's trouble between nations. There's trouble... We got two wars raging, one in Ukraine, one in Gaza. We've got the war raging between Donald Trump and Joe Biden and their followers, the MAGA people and the progressives, and they're calling each other names and throwing rocks at each other. We've got racial unrest in the country. We've got all sorts of unrest in the country, don't we? So maybe it's time we remind ourselves, yes, God is with us. No matter what we face, God is with us. We're not alone, are we? Now, it's interesting when you're a pastor, everybody expects you to put a theological spin on your own life for them. I told some of you about the woman in the hospital, not the hospital, the nursing home when I was there for rehab, who said to me, why isn't your husband here with you this week? I said, he died. I said, oh, and then the next day she forgot, she said, I forgot, why, was, why isn't your husband here? I said, he's still dead. And she said, why aren't your children here? I don't have children. She said, why don't you have children? I said, I couldn't have any. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought, wow apologizing because I don't have children. My husband died. Weird stuff, right? But I'm not by myself, am I? I have, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of parishioners from many churches. But I have God with me no matter what I face, and I know that. I know that without a doubt. I know that. My mom, the first time she had cancer, which she was 70 years old, which is only three and a half years older than I am now, oy, First time she had cancer, it was really bad. She had inflammatory carcinoma of the breast. Almost no one survives that. She survived it for 19 years. This cancer that she had before she died was a totally different kind of cancer. And that was a bad one, too. That was, in, that was called clear cell carcinoma of the endometrium. She suffered greatly, but she, after her first diagnosis, people came to me and said, what are you going to do if your mother dies? What will happen to your faith? I said, what do you mean what's going to happen to my faith if my mother dies? My mother's going to die someday, either from cancer or from something else. So who do you think taught me? My faith. My mom taught me my faith. My faith was intact. This is sort of the anti-Job book here, isn't it? This story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hi. How many times did you say that? Or stumble over it, or one or the other. You know, the precepts, the satraps, all those things. Um... It's a great story because, but if not. Why do I like but if not? My mother knew that she might die from her cancer, she said, but she wasn't going to give up. She told me so many times in my life, God did not bring you to this point to leave you alone now. Whenever I had a time that was I was down, she'd say, God did not bring you here to leave you alone now. I believe that. I trust my mother, and she taught me my faith. I remember sitting in that black rocking chair with her rocking me, singing me hymns every night. I learned all my hymns, not from seminary, from my mother singing them to me. She didn't have the best singing voice, but she sang out beautifully on those hymns. And I tell you what, I am not going to ask God why. I said, this is the anti-Job book. Poor old Job, right? We call him the patience of Job. He had no patience. He wanted an answer. He wanted to know why. His wife said, just curse God and die. Get it over with, buddy. And his friends came to comfort him by saying, you know, surely you brought this on yourself, boy. Really great friends to have, huh? But what does Job do? He wants, he wants God to just tell him why. Tell me why, tell me why, tell me why. I don't want God to tell me why. 
I just want God to say, I love you, and you're here with me, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The promise Jesus made, I will keep that, keep landing on that promise the rest of my days. Just stop a minute, I'm getting fast again. Now, folks. Let my brain reset itself now and then. Now, I've shared on my Facebook page numerous times, and I've shared in sermons, writings of Stephen Charleston. Anybody seen him on my Facebook page or read any of his writings? He's a Native American. He's an elder in his tribe, but he's also an Episcopal bishop, which doesn't seem to make much sense. He wrote this the other day, and I, I always save what he writes when it speaks to me. Walking on water may be above my spiritual pay grade, but I do have one ability when I share with a great many others in this community. I have learned to walk on air. I step out in hope, trusting that reality will support me. Sometimes it does, sometimes I'm disappointed, but I keep going, walking with the spirit on the fresh air of a very old promise. Let me read that one to you again. Walking on water may be above my spiritual pay grade, and I know it's above mine. I do have one ability, one I share with a great many others in this community. I have learned to walk on air. I step out in hope, trusting that reality will support me. Sometimes it does, sometimes I'm disappointed, but I keep going, walking with the spirit on the fresh air of a very old promise. There is hope in the world. We have to seize on the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. Amen? How many of you believe in hope these days? That's good. We've got some hopers in the congregation this morning. We've got to believe in hope. We have to believe in hope because that's what we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which is why when things are tough, it's good to remember people who are very, very faithful. Some of them are in our great cloud of witnesses. This week, if you look at my Facebook page, you saw Jürgen Moltmann had died. He's a theologian who wrote a book called The Theology of Hope. And he said, hope is something that once you have it, you suffer under it. And I thought that was weird at first. But I thought about what he was saying. It makes you say, I can't just say in the sweet by and by things will be better. I have to change them now. I have to work to change the, the present to match the future. And also, my friend Ed Grove died, who was a pastor in West Virginia. He and Al Clip and I were called lovingly sometimes the unholy trinity of the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. The three of us were always together, always getting into trouble somewhere or the other. And now two of them are with Christ full time, and I know one day I'll be with them too. Until that day, I have to hold on to the hope that is ours in Christ. I have to keep preaching, whether it's in the congregation or it's to anyone I meet. I've got to tell them the hope that is mine in Jesus Christ. I may not get better. I may get a little bit better. I may I'm going to do some speech therapy and some occupational therapy and some physical therapy. Medication seems to be doing some good with my walking. Not so much with my voice yet, but it's getting a little bit better. But I'm going to keep working at it. I'm going to keep up, keeping on with Christ because God is my help, my rock, and my redeemer. Now, the passage from Isaiah that we read is the call to worship. It was on a cross. I didn't know it was on the cross. I got a cross when it was ordained from the clergy women in the conference. In those days, there were so few of us that we could sit around two tables in a church basement and have a luncheon, an annual conference. Now there's so many we couldn't fit in the ballroom, I don't think. But... We'd sit there together, and we'd pray together, and there were so few clergy women being ordained in those days that they would give us each a present. We can't even afford that anymore. There's so many. I got a cross that had a T on the front for Terry. I didn't know until I looked at the back because I had to do something really hard that night. The night before my ordination, I spoke against someone else who wanted to be ordained. She'd been responsible for the death of one of her church members. She had a bank card that she used to access the church funds to take herself out for fast food, things like that. She was out of control. She needed to take some time off and stop. And I spoke against her. She was deaf. It broke my heart to do that. Now, one of my seminary professors came to me that night and said, thank you for putting the church ahead of your own feelings. It's very hard to do. But, mm. hang on a second, sorry. I looked at the cross that night. It was hanging around my neck. I had got it that afternoon. On the back, it said, I've called you by name. You are mine. She had one, too. And I thought, God has called you, and we'll both get through this together. 
who would indeed get through it together. But if God has called you, there's nothing that's going to ever stop you. It's never going to get in your way. God has called each of us not to be a pastor, but God has called us each to the life and work of a disciple in the kingdom of God. So I hope you'll think when you get into tough times, but if not, but if not, but if not. You see why I like that now? God can save me. God could make me well. God could make me speak clearly. God could make me look younger and act younger. God could change my hair color to this fake color if God wanted to. But God, even if he doesn't, God's still with me. I will continue to serve with all that I have in me. God can heal me, and God may heal me yet. But even if God doesn't, I will not stop praising my Savior. So I hope you'll take this passage from Daniel to heart. And when things are tough in your life, so you'll turn to it and say, maybe God will get me out of this, maybe God won't. But even if God doesn't, I will not stop praising my Savior. Amen? Amen. Would you please stand and join in singing? <laughs>